Albert Einstein is widely acclaimed as one of the greatest and most influential scientists in history. In 1999, Physics World, which is a British journal, ranked him the greatest physicist of all time. Similarly, the History Channel called Einstein the greatest mind of the 20th century. Physicist Brian Greene, writing in Scientific American, declared, Einstein has come to symbolize the purity and power of intellectual exploration. Two Einstein scholars have recently said that Einstein has left his mark not only on physics of the 20th century, but also on the public image of science and scientists and on the cultural and political history of the 20th century, far beyond his area of expertise. The media and many popular books have largely refrained from expressing negative views about Einstein, primarily due to the widespread idolization of him around the world. Back in 2018, science writer Philip Ball of the British newspaper The Guardian discovered that Einstein said what many would consider racist statements about Chinese and Japanese people. Yet Ball defended Einstein by saying that, even this famously humane and broad-minded scientist was inevitably a man of his time. Accordingly, we can't expect him, despite his visceral dislike of Nazism, to rise above a prevailing culture in which the open expression of prejudice was routine. We might look on it now with dismay, but to label it racism is to indulge a presentism that achieves nothing except making us feel superior. Yet doesn't Ball condemn both the statements and actions of figures such as Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong and Adolf Hitler? If the answer is yes, does this condemnation make him feel superior? These arguments don't follow logically because they lack coherence. Furthermore, if we absolve Einstein of any guilt regarding racism, what moral right do we have to condemn other historical figures who have expressed similar sentiments? Can we simply attribute their views to being products of their time? Or is it possible that figures like Einstein were adhering to an ideology, one that continues to exert a detrimental impact on much of the West? Based on the archival evidence, Ball admits that Einstein treated his wife, Milva Marek, miserably, that he considered her as his maid and housekeeper, and that she was neither to expect intimacy from me nor to reproach me in any way, and that Marek has to desist immediately from addressing me if I request it. Ball asserted that these statements are not expressions of generalized misogyny. It's evident that Ball makes an exception for Einstein finding it appalling if anyone else were to say something similar. Ball said of physicist Richard Feynman. Feynman's reputation has undergone some recent reappraisal on the centenary of his birth, with a belated recognition of the shockingly demeaning things he says about women in his autobiography. Some have unconvincingly tried to brush these off as the product of their times, but it seems more likely they are a product of the macho persona Feynman liked to cultivate. But is Einstein an exception to the rule? Clearly, Philip Ball is not presenting a coherent argument. The significant question at hand is this. Can we genuinely attribute Einstein's views to being a product of his time, or is there another underlying factor at play? This is not a documentary about Einstein's life and career, nor is it an exhaustive account of his childhood. In fact, this presentation intentionally avoids delving into Einstein's early years due to its unnecessary length and detail. Instead, this short documentary aims to shed light on the darker aspects of Albert Einstein. Einstein once collaborated with the famous sexual revolutionary by the name of Wilhelm Reich. Reich was the man who perpetuated the organ energy, which is the idea that neuroses as well as physical illnesses such as cancer derive from a lack of organ energy in the body. Reich, we are told, proposed that this energy could be restored through treatments such as generating sexual organisms and sitting in an organ accumulation box. It didn't take a genius to realize that Reich was onto something unrelated to science and entirely focused on perpetuating his sexual revolution. Reich, an Austrian Jew, was a key figure in the sexual revolution, 
credited with coining the term itself. Among his popular works are The Sexual Revolution, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and The Function of the Orgasm. Alongside figures such as Erich Fromm, Eric Erikson and Ernst Simmel, Reich belonged to a cohort of ideologues in the 1920s and 30s who, according to Elizabeth and Danto viewed psychoanalysis more as a social mission than merely a medical discipline. Reich established his network or organization, known as SexPol, an abbreviation for the German Society of Proletarian Sexual Politics. Reich writes in his book, The Sexual Revolution, we do not want to see natural sexual attraction, stamped as sin, sensuality fought as something low and beastly, and the conquering of the flesh, made the guiding principle of morality. If moral concepts with respect to sexuality ought to be eliminated, then almost anything is permitted, including sex with children, which Reich advocated in his book The Mass Psychology of Fascism. By 1932, Reich was so radical that Freud himself had to urge his followers to, quote, step against Reich. Anna, Freud's daughter, said, my father can't wait to get rid of him in as much as he attaches himself to psychoanalysis. That which my father finds offensive in Reich is the fact that he has forced psychoanalysis to become political. Anna added that psychoanalysis has no part in politics. The narrative takes an intriguing turn in January of 1941, when Wilhelm Reich engaged in an almost five-hour discussion with none other than Albert Einstein. During their meeting, they delved into what Reich termed sex economy. Notably, when Einstein expressed concerns about the increasing anti-Semitism in Germany, Reich corresponded with him, asserting that he had uncovered specific biologically effective energy that exhibited behaviors differing from what was understood about electromagnetic energy. For Reich, this biologically effective energy could be used in the fight against the fascist pestilence. And this sexualized ideology would be a rival perhaps to the incipient atomic bomb. Reich also believed that sexual ideologies are like atomic bombs. They have the power to destroy lives. While the extent of Reich's influence on Einstein or vice versa remains uncertain, their comprehension of each other was evident. There's a moment when Reich confided in his wife, expressing his excitement about conversing with someone who comprehended the intricacies of these physical phenomena and grasped their implications immediately. Reich, in his desperate attempt to deconstruct morality, tried to use physics to justify his own sexual theories. This was called organ accumulator, but it simply didn't work scientifically. Einstein eventually distanced himself from Reich's experiment. Some suggest Einstein's decision stemmed from concerns about maintaining scientific credibility and avoiding alignment with Reich's theories. Reich later wrote, it was understandable that Einstein did not want to contribute to the collapse of his life's work, although this would have been demanded by strict scientific objectivity. While Reich's ideology failed to gain scientific acceptance, it undeniably became politicized. Moreover, Einstein did not really need organoscope to rationalize his sexual freedom. But the question for us still is simply this, was Einstein a plagiarist, a wife-beater, and a eugenicist? By 1912, Einstein was already on the road of sexual excess, despite the fact that he was married to Milva Merrick. Einstein met Milva at the Polytechnic in Zurich, where they both had a keen interest in physics. They eventually got married on January 6, 1903, but due to Einstein's sexual adventure and abuse, the marriage turned into a complete disaster. Einstein, like Charles Darwin before him, embarked on a sexual relationship with his cousin Elsa Einstein, who had been divorced since 1908 and had two daughters aged 15 and 13. This grieved his wife even more. Biographer Hans C. Ohanian writes that when Einstein arrived in Berlin, he quote, did not spend much time at home. Sometimes he would disappear for a week leaving Malva ignorant of his whereabouts. Malva suspected he was spending days and nights in the arms of the plump and eager Elsa. 
We do not know how Milva found out about the adulterous liaison. But we do now that in July, after a violent quarrel, she suddenly moved out of their apartment and with the boys went to live in the home of the Hyber family. On October 10, Einstein wrote to Elsa saying that Milva is the most sour sourpost that ever existed. I shudder at the thought of seeing her and you together. She will writhe like a worm if she sees you even from afar. Malva later complained that we are a bit unimportant to him and that we take second place. Malva's complaint was not without evidence. Einstein himself wrote to Elsa, I treat my wife as an employee whom I cannot fire. I have my own bedroom and avoid being alone with her. Writer Michel Zakheim declares, quote, Milva had planned to accompany Albert to Paris, where on March 26, 1913, he was giving a lecture on the law of photochemical equivalence. But on March 14, Lisbeth Hertwitz, the daughter of family friends, wrote in her diary that she and her mother had visited Milva and were shocked to see Milva with her face badly bruised and swollen. Albert explained that it was caused by a dental problem. Milva would not answer her friend's inquiries. Albert traveled to Paris alone. Isaac Haim says that even after all the humiliation, Milva persisted in trying to hold her marriage together. Then Albert unleashed a list of unreasonable demands to Milva, which the Daily Mail called a misogynistic manifesto. Quote, Albert decided that if Malva wanted to stay married to him, she would have to obey his rules. A. You will see to it, 1. That my clothes and linen are kept in order, 2. That I am served three regular meals a day in my room, 3. That my bedroom and study are kept in good order, and that my desk is not touched by anyone other than me. B. You will renounce all personal relations with me except when they are required to keep up social appearance. In particular, you will not request 1. That I sit with you at home, 2. That I go out with you or travel with you. C. You will promise explicitly to observe the following points in any contact with me. 1. You will expect no affection from me and you will not reproach me for this. 2. You must answer me at once when I speak to you. 3. You must leave my bedroom or study at once without protesting when I ask you to go. D. You will promise not to denigrate me in the eyes of the children, either by word or by deed. Ever since you have been in Berlin, you have become quite nasty. You should know that people take an interest in the way the great man himself, of course, behaves. Shortly thereafter, Einstein wrote to a friend, Life without my wife is a veritable rebirth for me personally. He continued to humiliate his lovely wife throughout his life, saying things like, Had I known you 12 years ago as I know you now, I would have viewed my responsibilities toward you at that time quite differently. Milva, Einstein declared, is and will forever remain for me an amputated limb. I will never again be close to her. I will finish my days far from her feeling this is absolutely necessary. Zakheim writes, Milva still hoped that he might come back to her. Perhaps she thought that the longer he remained on his own, the better chance there was of finding a peaceful solution and keeping the family intact. After all, he had told her that he liked being a bachelor and that his autonomy revealed itself as an indescribable blessing to me. She could not believe that he was asking for a divorce it could only mean that he wanted to remarry. In 1919, when the marriage between the two partners was finally over, Einstein's own statement seemed to have confirmed that he did indeed get involved in physical abuse. He specifically declared to the court that he had no accusations against the plaint of his wife. During the marriage there have been numerous scenes because of differences of opinion where on the part of the plaintiff verbal and physical abuse occurred to which I, in a state of irritation, responded, it is true that I committed adultery. I have been living for approximately four and one half years with my cousin, the widow Elsa Lowenthal, and since then I have had intimate relations with her. 
My wife, the plaintiff, has been informed that I have had intimate relations with my cousin since the summer of 1914. She expressed her indignations to me. Einstein's sexual exploration did not stop when he met Elsa. After four years of marriage with Elsa, he moved his sexual relativity to Bette Newman, his secretary. Prior to that, he also wanted to marry Elsa's daughter Ilse. Ilse told a friend, Yesterday, suddenly the question was raised about whether a wish to marry Mama or me. Albert himself is refusing to take any decision. He is prepared to marry either Mama or me. I know that A loves me very much, perhaps more than any other man ever will. He also told me so himself yesterday. But I have never wished nor felt the least desire to be close to him physically. A also thought that if I did not wish to have a child of his it would be nicer for me not to be married to him. And I truly do not have this wish. I do not know whether it really would be fair, after all my mother's years of struggle, if I were to compete with her over the place she had won for herself, now that she is finally at the goal. When the divorce between Einstein and Milva finally occurred, Milva never remarried. Albert, on the other hand, was only just beginning his romantic exploits. He continued his pursuit of women and his extramarital affairs long after his marriage to Elsa. Zakheim writes clearly, Albert had no patience with and very little respect for women. The only female scientist to whom he accorded a modicum of respect was Marie Curie, and even that he could not do without qualification, even from Elsa, he kept his distance. Once when she referred to the two of them as us, Albert retorted, talk about you or me, but never about us. Arguably, the most shocking claim, based on evidence from Zakheim, suggests that Einstein abandoned his only daughter, Liesel, purportedly due to the belief that she was mentally handicapped. Einstein's younger son, Eduard Ortiz, born in 1910, developed schizophrenia as a young man, apparently in consequence of a disturbing love affair with an older woman. After Milva's death in 1948, Teat was placed with foster families and then again confined until his own death in 1965. Einstein made a quick visit to Teat at the Burgosli in 1933, before leaving for the United States. After that he broke off all contact and sent no letters. Harvard donor's wife caught up in plagiarism accusations. There uh, is the glamour shot. Mary Oxman, the wife of American hedge fund manager Bill Ackman, admitted to plagiarizing in her doctoral dissertation while getting her PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. We've noted the irony here. Her husband Ackman has taken a hard line stance on plagiarism. On Wednesday, responding to news that Claudine Gay is set to remain a part of Harvard's faculty. After she resigned as president, he wrote on X that Gay should be fired completely due to, quote, serious plagiarism issues. Business insider with the details. Students are forced to withdraw for much less, Ackman continued, rewarding her with a highly paid faculty position. Sets a very bad precedent for academic integrity at Harvard. What about where your wife went? Massachusetts uh, Institute. Hmm, never mind. Ackman was one of the most vocal critics of Gay, Harvard's first ever black president. And in his lengthy public tirade against Gay, Ackman also accused her of anti Semitism. In a report published by Business Insider, Oxman allegedly plagiarized multiple paragraphs of her 2010 doctoral dissertation. The report found at least one passage directly lifted from other writers without citation. The Hub News with more on it. Oxman wrote on X, formerly Twitter, I was forwarded an email this morning from a reporter at Business Insider who noted that there are four paragraphs in my 330 page PhD dissertation, Material Based Design Computation, which I completed at MIT in 2010, where I admitted quotation marks for certain work that I used for each of the four 
paragraphs in question. I properly credited the original sources authors with references at the end of each of the subject paragraphs and in the detailed by bibliography rather end pages of the dissertation. She continued, in these four paragraphs, however, I did not place the subject language in quotation marks, which would be the proper approach for crediting the work. I regret and apologize for these errors. Now, <clears throat> cases she apologized for were similar in character to some cases that the Washington Free Beacon found in Claudine Gay's academic history. Failures to use quotation marks around passages from works that were otherwise cited. It can happen, I guess. Business Insider found, however, even more instances a day after their first report. But a thorough review of her published work revealed that Oxman's failure to cite sources went beyond that and included multiple instances of plagiarism in which she passed off writing from other sources as her own without citing the original in any way. At least 15 passages from her 2010 MIT doctoral dissertation were lifted without any citation from Wikipedia entries. But like other academics, she also published lengthy detailed research papers, sometimes with other authors, sometimes by herself. The bulk of the plagiarism Business Insider found was in her dissertation, which runs more than 300 pages. Wikipedia wasn't the only research she cited without attribution in the paper that earned her a doctorate. In a footnote, she used 54 consecutive words without attribution from the website of the design software maker Rhino to explain what a non-uniform rational B spline is. She also used technical language from about tessellations that match language from the website Wolf from Math World, which again, he didn't sigh. She plagiarized both before and after she received her PhD in 2010 of three peer reviewed papers reviewed by Business Insider. Two 2007's Get Real Towards Performers Driven Computational Ge- Geometry and 2011's Variable Proper Rapid Prototyping also contain plagiarism. Business Insider saw a comment from Ackman and Oxman. They declined via spokesperson, but after Business Insider had emailed its findings to Oxman, Ackman posted a response on X in which he promised to conduct plagiarism reviews of MIT's leadership. The issue of plagiarism has been a prominent topic in recent years. For instance, Jewish billionaire Bill Ackman, known for his outspoken nature, strongly criticized Claude Gay a woman of color who was formerly the president of Harvard. Ackman alleged that Gay had plagiarized in her doctoral dissertation and further accused her of anti-Semitism, claiming she did not take adequate action against anti-Semitic incidents at Harvard during the Israel and Hamas conflict that began in October 2023. Consequently, Gay was eventually dismissed from her position at Harvard. Interestingly, Just a few days after Claude Gay was removed from her position, Business Insider meticulously documented that Neri Oxman, the wife of billionaire Bill Ackman and a professor at MIT, also faced allegations of plagiarism in her dissertation. What added to the controversy was Ackman's response, accusing Business Insider of being motivated by anti-Semitism. This suggests a concerning double standard where Ackman feels justified in accusing others of plagiarism, yet alleges bias when the same scrutiny is applied to his family. This incident raises questions about underlying ideologies at play. It is important to note that such ideologies have persisted over time. There is a hesitancy among some writers and scholars to document allegations of plagiarism against figures like Einstein possibly influenced by concerns related to anti-Semitism. Addressing these issues calls for a fair and unbiased approach in evaluating claims of plagiarism across the board. So let us take a brief look at Einstein's plagiarism. Mathematician Roger Schlafly has recently resurrected the long-forgotten argument, suggesting that much of what is attributed to Einstein's work might actually have originated from others. According to Schlafly, the celebrated mathematician Henri Poincaré and physicist Hendrik Lorentz had explored the realm of relativity long before Einstein delved into the topic. 
This argument implies that Einstein popularized these concepts without duly acknowledging their original proponents. This point was articulated by a British mathematician and historian of science, Sir Edmund T. Whittaker, 1873-1956, who wrote in his work, A History of the Theories of Ather and Electricity, that the equation E as MC2 was the creation of Lorentz and Poincaré. Einstein's friend and colleague, Max Born, had even tried to persuade Whittaker not to publish this opinion. But Born himself later admitted that it was highly plausible that Einstein got his idea from Poincaré. Similar points were made by Russian physicist A. A. Logunov in his book Henri Poincaré and Relativity Theory. It was after he was confronted with this fact by Whittaker that Einstein hoped that posterity would give Lorentz and Poincaré some credit to the theory. As biographer Albrecht Folsing puts it, after nearly half a century, this was the first time that Einstein ever mentioned Poincaré in connection with the special relativity theory. Biographer Dennis Bryan, however, declared that the charge that Einstein got some of his work from somewhere else has little weight. The evidence, no one, not even Poincaré, argues Bryan, has ever charged Einstein of plagiarism. But Bryan failed to mention that Lawrence came close to saying that Einstein snatched relativity out of his hand. Lawrence said, Einstein simply postulates what we, Lawrence and Poincer, have deduced. Schlafly argues, On every essential part of special relativity, Poincaré published the same idea years earlier and said it better. It was Lorentz's and Poincaré's work, not Einstein's, that led to time being considered the fourth dimension. Schlafly continues to say that while historians prefer to credit Einstein for the theory, no one can dispute the fact that Poincaré discovered all the elements of special relativity with help from Lorentz and others, published them before Einstein, and developed a theory that was either identical or observationally equivalent to Einstein's. Einstein's 1905 paper in particular fails to cite any references to the scientific literature. The failure is extremely odd, since the best mathematical physicists in Europe had been writing papers on the subject for 10 years, and Einstein did not cite any of them. Einstein again said, I know that philosophically a murderer is not responsible for his crime, but I prefer not to take tea with him. Einstein, mind you, did believe morality exists, but this is where determinism receives a fatal blow. If Einstein believes that a murderer is not responsible for his crime, then how was he able to condemn Adolf Hitler? Einstein was trapped in his own philosophical deadness. We all know that an action is free only if the person doing the action could have done otherwise. If the person couldn't possibly have acted differently, or if the person could never have done anything other than what he or she did, then moral responsibility or accountability is in jeopardy. Or, as philosopher Peter Van Inwagen puts it, a person is morally responsible for failing to perform a given act only if he could have performed that act. As a corollary, a person is morally responsible for a certain event particular only if he could have prevented it. And the very fact that some readers will disagree with this essential point inevitably strengthens it. For those who object, were they determined to disagree with the idea of free will? Or did they do it out of their own free will, an idea which has never been disproved by science? If they were determined, then why should we pay attention to anything they have to say? In short, those who set themselves up to deconstruct the nature of free will always end up copying it in a perverse way. Philosopher John Searle himself has said that even if a person is convinced that free is an illusion, that same person has to act on the presupposition of free will. In that sense, determinism is intellectually incoherent and internally contradictory. Moreover, Einstein and others are right, that free will is an illusion, that determinism is correct. Then what do we say to evolutionary psychologists who say that there is a biological basis for rape? If determinism is right, then almost any immoral act 
can be permissible because the person committing the crime cannot be responsible for it? Obviously, Einstein had good reasons to be a determinist because determinism allowed him to abandon his daughter, to fraternize with multiple women, and to fail to give credit where credit was due. As we shall see in the future, the Neo-Darwinian principle also perpetuates the idea that the universe and human beings are deterministic, that life has no metaphysical meaning, and that there is no such thing as objective morality. We will also demonstrate that both the Neo-Darwinian principle and Zionism are ideologically concentric circles. Einstein has widely been viewed as a humanitarian, but his diaries present a different picture. He called the Chinese filthy and obtuse, Time magazine reported in 2018. In 1922, Einstein told his close friend, the physicist Paul Ehrenfest, whose four-year-old son had recently been diagnosed with Down syndrome, that he agreed with his decision to institutionalize his son rather than care for him himself, because valuable people should not be sacrificed for causes without any prospects. Not even in this case. This obviously strengthened the idea that Einstein abandoned his daughter Liesel. One final thought before we close. Einstein made this stunning statement about Vladimir Lenin. In Lenin, I honor a man who in total sacrifice of his own person has committed his entire energy to realizing social justice. I do not find his methods advisable. One thing is certain, however, Men like him are the guardians and renewers of mankind's conscience. According to the Black Book of Communism and other scholarly materials, the Bolshevik Revolution claimed the lives of at least 25 million people in the former Soviet Union, 65 million in China, and 1.7 million in Cambodia, among other casualties. Considering this historical evidence, can we confidently suggest that Lenin and those aligned with him truly represent the guardians of mankind's conscience? If suggesting that Hitler did any good in Germany is considered an unpardonable sin or forbidden in academia and politics, why isn't Einstein universally condemned for expressing honor toward Lenin? Doesn't this situation imply an implicit double standard? Objections to this documentary may arise, with critics suggesting that Einstein could not have plagiarized the work of Lorentz and Poincaré due to his purported lack of knowledge about their contributions. These people claim that Einstein worked in isolation, with limited access to physics literature. However, this assertion is inaccurate. Maurice Solovine, a mathematician and philosopher who collaborated with Einstein, contradicts this notion. Solovine openly admitted that both he and Einstein enthusiastically studied Poincaré's 1902 book for weeks. Moreover, Einstein himself suggested that he had read Poincaré's and Lorentz's work meticulously. Jewish scientists like Gerald Holton, Abraham Pais, John Stackel, among others, have quickly come to Einstein's defense, saying that though Poincaré and Lorentz only discussed special relativity philosophically, Einstein came to the conclusion scientifically. Totally false. If you are physicist and mathematician, go check the historical evidence and see if those Jewish scientists are right. A classic example would be the general relativity priority dispute, which involved theoretical physicist Friedrich Winterberg of the University of Nevada and three other scientists, Leo Corey, Jürgen Wren, and John Stachel. In 1997, Corey Wren and Stachel wrote an article entitled Belated Decision in the Hilbert Einstein Priority Dispute, saying Einstein did not plagiarize on the work of mathematician David Hilbert. The authors also claimed, or suggested, that it wasn't Einstein who plagiarized because Hilbert corrected his paper after seeing Einstein's paper. According to Winterberg, this is completely false. The following long quotation is from Wikipedia. Winterberg published a refutation of these conclusions in 2004, observing that the galley proofs of Hilbert's articles had been tampered with. Part of one page had been cut off. 
He argued that the removed part of the article contained the equations that Einstein later published and alleged that it was part of a crude attempt by some unknown individual to falsify the historical record. He alleged that science had refused to print the article and thus he was forced to publish it in Germany. Winterberg's article argued that despite the missing part of the proofs, that the correct crucial field equation is still embedded on other pages of the proofs in various forms, including Hilbert's variational principle with correct Lagrangian, from which the field equation is immediately derived. Winterberg presented his findings at the American Physical Society meeting in Tampa, Florida in April 2005. What we observe here is that in order for Corey, Wren, and Stachel to challenge the notion that Einstein could not have worked in isolation on some of his papers, or that he derived ideas from various sources, including Hilbert, they had to give a redacted version of the Hilbert equation, not the complete work. This dismissal would undermine their perspectives entirely. It's worth noting that Corey, Wren, and Stachel's paper was published in Science Magazine. Winterberg late wrote, It has long been known that Hilbert had obtained these equations before Einstein. Wren is quoted in the Washington Post of November 14, 1997 with the statement, I had personally come to the conclusion that Einstein plagiarized Hilbert. As admitted by Corey, Wren and Stachel the cutoff part contained the Ricci invariant, which enters Hilbert's variational principle. His field equations and the variational principle from which they follow are still in the proofs, but not his abbreviation for the variational derivative, containing the trace term missing in all of Einstein's previous papers. Some scientists hesitate to engage in discussions about the possibility of Einstein being a plagiarizer due to the fear of being labeled as anti-Semites. What good will it serve, those scientists seem to reason, to expose Einstein if their lives and livelihood will be in jeopardy. It might be high time for prominent scientists to adhere to historical and scientific standards, embracing a commitment to truth, honest research, and the exposure of frauds and malpractice wherever they may surface. Are popular scientists courageous enough to confront this issue? Let us conclude with the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn himself. Our way must be, never knowingly support lies. Having understood where the lies begin, step back from that gangrenous edge. Let us not glue back the flaking scale of the ideology, not gather back its crumbling bones, nor patch together its decomposing garb, and we will be amazed how swiftly and helplessly the lies will fall away and that which is destined to be naked will be exposed as such to the world.